everybody? Hi. How are you doing? <clears throat> I guess we can start, huh? Um, my name's Dan Chiris. Some of you probably just heard me speak and rant and rave about oil and stuff. But what I want to do today is talk about passive solar design. It's one of my favorite subjects. I, I wrote a book on the subject called The Solar House. It's been by far one of my best-selling books in the last four or five years. Um, the Solar House, it's a design guide for passive heating and cooling, and you don't have to be an engineer to, to understand it. It's written for those of us who aren't engineers. So anyway, I've got some copies for sale in, in, at the right after this workshop in booth 46. So there's some copies of that. And also, brand new book, The Homeowner's Guide to Renewable Energy, which is more broadly about all the renewable energy technologies for our homes. So that's what we're going to talk about today, free heat for life. Um, to me, it's almost a no-brainer. If you could design a house that heats and cools itself naturally, that's comfortable to live in, that's beautiful, and you're going to virtually have no utility bill, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, why would you go, why would you obligate yourself to tens of thousands of dollars in utility bills? So um, it's really a no-brainer. No um, so, uh, I have a website if you want to check out, learn more, it's www.banchiris.com. Very inventive, very, very creative. So here's where we're going to go today. Um, to, I, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself. I won't bore you with that too much. I want to talk about what is passive solar. I'm sure all of you have some familiarity with it, but I want to talk a little bit more about what it is. And what are some of our design options? Remember, we have one hour to cover what I usually teach in a, a weekend workshop. So, I mean, we're going to try to put a lot of material together. There will be, be some subjects that I won't cover, but I oftentimes teach this as a weekend workshop. So, you're going to get the, the short version, the Reader's Digest version. We're going to talk about the principles of solar, passive solar design, and very importantly, all the mistakes that we, people can make. We're going to talk, I want to focus on, on how people take the principles and you know, they sort of apply them, but they get it wrong. There's a lot of very bad passive solar design out there. So we want to avoid passing on all those mistakes. And um, I encourage you when, you, when you go to visit a solar house, that you ask the homeowners what works and what doesn't work. Because a lot of times there are things that you see that you think, wow, that's really cool. I want to do that too. But had you asked the homeowner, you find out, well, maybe that didn't really work so well. So there's some, I want to give you some warnings about that. I did an article in Home Power magazine called Solar Design Blunders, published uh, probably a year or so ago, which is 10 common mistakes in solar, solar design. So if you want to get a copy of that, um, as you guys all know, for those of you who heard my earlier talk, I'm a writer. I've published, that's what I do for a living. I teach for a hobby. I teach at Colorado College a couple classes a year, but I'm a full-time writer. Um, I do a lot of solar design and natural building consultation. I con consult on houses all over the country. In fact, when I leave here Sunday, I'm heading up to Traverse City because I've been working on a project up there, um, a solar, passive solar uh, eco-learning center and residence. So I do a lot of that. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, and I practice solar. I've lived in, a pet, in solar homes for the past 30 years. Um, the last 10 years have been in this off-grid solar home where we're just virtually free of energy bills. I haven't paid an electric bill in 10 years to this day, to this month. The last utility bill I paid for electricity was 10 years ago, almost to this day. So I've um, got a lot of practical experience. This is my home in Evergreen. It's a lot prettier than that on a good day. Um, but it's uh, earth sheltered. It's backed into a hillside. It's all passive solar, solar electric, little wind machine. It's no longer here. Never, 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 never install a wind machine against a building or structure that's occupied. We move that. It just makes too much racket. Okay, it's just too much vibration. Um, we thought we'd try it because the manufacturer was recommending it, but not a good idea. Um, so this is the house. It's built out of almost all recycled materials, all used materials, um, and it's virtually 100% self-sufficient. We, we generate certainly more electricity than we need, but we don't sell it back to the grid because they just want it too damn much to read the meter. There's another angle of it. Here's the inside, um, what you can see of it. Lord, we need a, we need a darker tent. Um, yeah, there it is. It's really pretty up here. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's a very spacious house. And one of the things that, that, that I'm a real advocate about is creating a buffer zone between living between your solar glazing and your living areas. A lot of solar houses are designed so that, if, say this is a solar house and that's south, 
the windows start there and the living space starts right here and you end up frying everybody you know you fry your pets you fry your plants so it's really important to create some kind of a buffer zone between you and the sun so that you can still live in the house and um, anyway we use solar electricity a fairly small system these are the books I just mentioned we don't need to talk about that so as I mentioned this morning passive solar is a heating system with only one moving part and that's the sun and of course it's really not the sun it's the earth that rotates the sun's stationary but um, it's a very simple system it's as simple as it can get uh, for heating a home and there's there's the culprit that's the that's the source of energy 93 million miles away um, it can provide virtually all your heat in a in a good climate um, passive Passive solar heating is a component of something we call natural conditioning, okay? And it's part of a package of ideas that we use um, for home construction. It is part of this natural conditioning is about how we heat our homes, how we cool them, and a lot of what you do to heat a home, will, believe it or not, passively, will also cool it in the summer. So that's what's really cool. You invest your money in a heating strategy, but it's also a lot of the things that you do are going to pay off in how the home is cooled. It's going to provide natural cooling, passive cooling. Um, it also provides a lot of daylighting. So the, these strategies all complement each other. They all work together. So you get a lot more for your money than you think you're getting. And you get a very bright and cheerful interior. And ventilation is part of this whole strategy too. So how do we heat and cool, light, and ventilate a house with as little outside energy as possible, with as much solar energy and not not the uh, you know utility power energy so it's a natural way of heating and cooling our homes without the, all that costly mechanical equipment can you guys hear me okay in the back you alright okay um, without all the costly um, mechanical equipment and not nuclear energy or fossil fuels you're doing it with a with a nuclear reactor that's about 93 million miles away a big fusion reaction reactor that's not going to cause us a whole lot of problems um, so I already mentioned the complementarity of design and that is that what you do to passively heat a home will also cool it. And it's just, and so that's why you have to pay really close attention to the design. I get a lot of clients who will have, buy their house and the view is to the west and they want to do a passive solar home. And they say, well, I'm just going to tilt that house to the west. And, you know, they might only tilt it 20 degrees or so. And they say, well, that, you know, that is only going to decrease my solar gain by a little bit. But what you have to think is, what is it going to do in the summer? And in the summer, it's going to result in a lot more heating. So you're, going to, you're not going to get as much sunlight in the winter. You're going to get a lot more sunlight in the summer by just violating, you know, instead of orienting to true south and, and by tilting it off a little bit, you're going, to, you're going to end up having a much higher cooling bill, a lot, lot less uh, comfort in that structure. So um, think systems when you're thinking design. If you change this, how's it going to affect the cooling? If you change that, how's it going to affect the heating? How's it going to affect the lighting? So just always be thinking, whatever you do is going to mess up something else or it might improve something else. And so think in terms of systems. We have three options for solar design. D direct gain, and I'm going to, I'll show you some pictures of that. Indirect gain and isolated gain. So these are the three types of solar design for passive solar. Passive because there's no mechanics. That's why we call it passive. So direct gain, most of the homes, new homes are direct gain. I've got some pictures to illustrate this. This is a direct gain home. This is in uh, Colorado. It's facing south. Most of the windows are on the south side. The house is the solar collector. Okay? Solar energy is invited into the house and it heats the house directly. Hence the name direct gain. Okay? Um, indirect gain is a technique. Ugh, these pictures are off. Does it help to even move it closer? Does that help at all? Indirect gain, there's a structure behind this glass called a trom wall or a thermal storage wall. And I've got a diagram to show it. This is what we call indirect gain. And you use south facing glass and then the glass is separated from a big mass wall, usually poured concrete or, or a cinder block, cement blocks filled with concrete or adobe or some kind of earthen material which provides mass, thermal mass. And so the sun shines through this wall, through the glass wall, hits that mass wall, warms it up during the day and then that heat migrates slowly to the interior of the home. So by the, when the sun sets, you've got this nice warm wall that radiates heat into the room. That's indirect gain. You're, you're gaining heat, but indirectly through an intermediary, the thermal storage wall, or trom wall after the French engineer who designed the thing. 
And here's how, here's how it works. Oh, that actually showed up pretty well. Here's, here's a cutaway of the wall showing the mass in the glass. Here's the glass layer here. Can you guys see all right? And here's the thermal mass. So light shines through here, heats up the wall, and the heat migrates through. You can also put vents in the wall so that air circulates through there to get daytime heating. So if, you, if this is an office or something where you want some daytime heating, you can put some vents in there and you get this natural convection flow. Uh, cool air flows in here, it warms up, and the rising, the hot air rises and expands, and it actually forms a thermal siphon. It sucks air in here, so it creates a convection, a natural convection current that will provide some daytime heating. By and large, these are kind of difficult to get to work right. The trial walls work pretty well. A lot of people run into troubles with these because they don't close them off at night. They don't put any kind of a vent or a louvered vent in here. And so at night, what do you suppose happens? It goes in the reverse. There, you create a reverse cycle. So a lot of people just don't even, don't even put vents in the wall. Um, and if they want daytime heating, what will they do? They'll put a window in the wall. So it's not like you have to look at a big concrete wall. It, Trauma walls, a lot of people get worried about it and go, well, I don't want to look at concrete, but boy, I, that last house I had had beautiful trauma walls in it. And they were, they were uh, stuccoed real nicely and they had a big window in it, so it's really very, very attractive. If you want a room that you want nighttime heat in, like a bedroom, and you want it to be dark at night, which I'm a, I really like to sleep in the dark, you go through life in the dark sometimes, but that's, you know, that trauma wall is a really good idea. It works in a lot of climates. Now this is, a, this is the house, I, this is my former solar house. Um, it, here's the direct gain, here's the indirect gain, and also we also built an attached sun space, which is isolated gain, okay? Attached sun space, or a solar greenhouse, isolated gain. That means that you gain heat in an isolated structure and then try to transfer it into the main living space, okay? So direct gain, the house is a collector. Indirect gain, you've got that intermediary, that mass wall. And isolated gain, you have an attached sun space. This is most amenable to retrofitting. I mean, if you've got a solar, a house, and you want to retrofit for solar, this is what a lot of people do. But believe me, there's a billion ways to screw this up. And I've seen every one of them, and I've made a few mistakes myself. Uh, there's a lot of material on getting these greenhouses right in this book. So if you're thinking about retrofitting, you want to do a, an attached sun space, read it very carefully because um, it's easy to goof up. What a lot of people do is they do an all-glass roof. And while it gives you lots of heat in, this, in the winter, it gives you tons of heat, more heat in the summer because the sun's beating down in the glass roof. And so you see it over and over again. People will just attach an all-glass greenhouse to the side of a house, and then they, they don't know what to do with it because they got so much summertime heat. Um, it's unbelievable. Here's a drawing of this attached sun space, all glass. By and large, stay away from it. Stay away from it. If you want to grow in this space, you know that you need you need sunlight from the from up above during the summer, right? You know that, that during the summer the sun's at a real high angle and plants don't grow. If you had a solid roof on here and you were trying to grow, plants don't grow very well in, in this greenhouse. So you're kind of you're kind of in a bind um, if you're trying to grow in these things, if you're trying to grow plants. If, I've tried to grow in, in similar structures and the tomatoes, for example, grow really tall. They'll grow 10 feet up and down, leggy, you know, they're not the they're, they're not even as wide as, as the stems aren't even as thick as my finger. They just grow real leggy because they're looking for sun and there's no sun. So if you, if you want to grow in one of these greenhouses, put a solid roof, but put some skylights in. And don't use conventional skylights. Use those uh, solar tube skylights. Much more efficient. Here's a design you absolutely must stay away from. Here's an all-glass enveloped design. Boy, the summertime heat in that is just unbearable. So stay away from that design. If you're building a new house, they're beautiful. You have a growing area right in the main part of your house. It's just absolutely gorgeous. They do not work in very many climates. They do not work. So stay away from glass roofs. Um, so here's all three. Here's direct gain, an isolated gain, and indirect gain. Um, <clears throat> all right, so there's a number of principles. We're going to talk about about a dozen principles of solar design. Choose a good site with a site with good solar access. Okay, and it's almost a no-brainer. You want sunlight. Okay, um, but believe me, there's some things you got to think about. Orient the house to the south. Um, concentrate the windows on the south. It doesn't mean all your windows have to be there, but you concentrate most of your windows on the south. 
and you minimize the glazing or the glass on the north side, east and west. I'm going to give you some rules about how much you should put on different parts of the house. Provide ad adequate overhang. You want to be sure you've got overhang to protect the glass, protect the house from summertime heat. You don't want that high angle winter sun to get in there so the overhang will protect your solar home during the summer. <clears throat> You want to incorporate thermal mass. You want something inside the house that will absorb the heat that you get during the winter. It'll take that sunlight, absorb the, the heat energy, and then radiate it at night into your room. A lot, of, a lot of solar homes are built without thermal mass. They get hot as hell during the day, and then they cool off at night because there's no, no mass holding that heat. So um, that last house of mine, I didn't build it, but I bought that house, didn't have anywhere near enough solar, thermal mass and it would get 85, 86 degrees in there during the, on, a hot, on a sunny, cold winter day. Almost unbearable. I mean, you could just walk around in a pair of shorts. It was just so hot. But just because the designer, the builder, put mass in it, but not enough. Not enough to absorb the solar gain. So um, insulate well. I mean, it's really important. Insulation is the key to making solar work. And even in solar, in, especially in solar challenge climates, you know, in climates without a lot of sunlight, Insulation really, it's your main ally. I've worked on houses in, um, in uh, the Northwest, and I know people have worked on houses in the Northeast, what we architect, or what architects and designers call the gloom belt in the United States, because there's just not a lot of sun. But if you're smart, you design the house right, you can still get 50% of your heat from the sun, even though the sun is only out 30% of the time in the winter. So it's all about being smart, orienting correctly, building correctly, and, um, and insulating very, very well. So you can still get a lot of solar energy, solar heating out of in a, in a cha solar challenge climate. And you want to protect that insulation from moisture. Moisture, you know, probably all know this, just a little tiny bit of moisture in insulation will decrease its R value, its ability to resist heat and just almost eliminate it, destroy it. So just a tiny, tiny bit of moisture in many forms of insulation will destroy it. So you want to be very careful that whatever, however you build this house, you make sure that insulation in the wall cavity stays dry. Airtight design, very, very important. Um, we build these houses energy efficient and airtight to keep that heat in. Um, I'm going to talk too about solar heating each room. I like the design where each room is its own, in a solar home, is its own collector. Okay? It gets a, it, this is, gets into some design um, problems. I'll talk about that. Create sun-free zones. Remember I was talking about this phenomenon, sun drenching. We gotta, you gotta get the sun into your house, but at the same time, you don't want to be sitting on the, in the, you know, on the morning, reading the newspaper and wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap to shade yourself. So you gotta, you gotta somehow get the sun into the house, get the heat in there, but you don't want to burn everything up in the process. And of course, you gotta provide some backup heat. All right, so let's let's take a look at each one of these principles in a. Um, I gotta keep a watch on my time here. The secret of passive solar design is all in the angle of the sun. And this is, uh, let's see, where this? This is from Florida. This is from southern Florida. And you see, on the shortest day of the year, December 21st, the, the altitude angle, the angle of the sun, if you're looking south in the sky, the angle of the sun from the horizon is 38 degrees. That's called the altitude angle. Okay, it's the shortest day of the year. The sun is also the lowest in the sky. And we use that low angle winter sun to heat our homes. That's the secret, is it's, we're trying to capture low angle winter sun. We don't overheat in the winter, in the summer, because the sun is at a very high angle. Here in Florida, in Florida it's at 86 degrees. So with good overhang, the sun will be pounding down on the roof. And I hear this all the time, don't you just die in that solar home of yours in the summer? No, you know, the reason you don't is because you're blocking that high angled winter sun. A lot of people don't even know the sun angle changes during the year. Just amazes me. What's going wrong with our educational system? Good solar access. You want a really good solar access. Um, key to solar design. Watch out for obstructions. Um, this guy's got a great solar design. You can't see it here, but there's a massive aspen grove right in front of his house. That was really cute when it was small and the trees were little, but now it's grown up. And even though the aspen trees lose their leaves during the winter, they still block a substantial amount of sunlight. The, the branches and the trunks of these trees still block a lot of sunlight. So avoid the trees on the south facing south uh, part of the home, especially conifer trees, pines and spruce. Or, just avoid entirely. Keep that southern end open. 
And ideally what you're shooting for is good solar access from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. Okay? If you've got a building site and you've got good access from 9 to 3 um, during the day, you've got it made. If it's 10 to 2, you're still okay. Once, you, once the window starts um, shortening or re decreasing, then your ability to provide solar heat substantially declines. So what that means, um, oh, and don't forget the trees grow. This was my last solar home. We bought it, it had a really good um, southern exposure. And unfortunately though, there are little trees, little pine trees all on here. Now they're all growing up. My ex-wife lives in there now, but they're all growing up. The trees are <laughs> gonna block her solar gain. So um, here's a guy built, this is a beautiful solar home in Colorado, beautiful solar home. And the original owner put a little spruce tree in here, it looked great at the time, and now 30 years later, 40 years later, it's blocked his entire solar gain. Entire solar gain. He doesn't get so sunlight until about one o'clock in the afternoon. So he gets he gets a little, but so watch that. You know, trees do grow. Don't forget, don't forget that uh, basic fact of life. Um, this guy built really smart. He built his house right on a highway. I would never build on a highway, but no one's going to block him. And you really have to watch out for other people building next to you. I've heard stories of people who build these wonderful solar homes, and then some schmuck comes in the lot next door, builds a two-story house, and blocks their solar gain. So you got to be really careful. Orient to the south. Always orient to true south, not magnetic south. They differ. True south are the lines of, lo of longitude. You go from the north pole to the south pole. That's true south. If you have a compass, compasses are liars. They never point true, well, they rarely point true south. The, the magnetic fields don't run true north and south. So if you go out to a site and you have a compass with you and it says that's south, your compass is very likely lying. That's magnetic south. It's not lying. It's not telling you the whole truth. It's magnetic south. And you want to orient to true south. And what it is, it's a, it, you can call the local... Um, the local surveyor and ask them what the magnetic declination is, and that's the that's the um, that's the like in an area like this. I'm not sure what it is. Anybody know magnetic declination is here? Three degrees? Very close. Very close. Good. So you guys are right on. Where I am, it's about 13 degrees. So if I go out with a compass and that says true south, it actually or that says magnetic south. True south is actually 13 degrees east of what the compass tells us. So you guys are in pretty good shape then. So orient to the south, true south. Here's a beautiful solar house, except he uses all glass design. He just absolutely bakes. And the view was to the west, so he put, he put all his glass on the west, and he just absolutely, I mean, it's a nice solar oven, really. Can, can, you, <laughs> can, can you put um, blinders on them? Basically, uh, I, I've seen them here, the little stock. Little, on it, not on it, but in the solar, inside my... Yeah, you can, but you always want shades on the outside of a window. <clears throat> Because once that sunlight gets in, you got the heat, you know. So concentrate your windows on the south. And, you know, that's obviously a no-brainer. You want the windows primarily on the south. Um, you should have about 7 to 12 percent of your square footage will be glass area. So if you're building a thousand square foot home, and you want to, you're serious about solar heating, your south-facing glass should be about 7 to 12 percent of the, the square footage of that house. So you've got a thousand square foot home, you'll need somewhere between 70 and 120 square feet of glass. If you're trying to get a lot of sunlight, a lot of solar gain, you're almost always, we're up here in the 12% range. We're really, you know, we really have to have about 12%. And that's actual glass, you know, that's windows minus the frame. So that's actual glass area, okay? So that's, that's the rule of thumb, 7 to 12% of your <clears throat> floor space, or for south facing glass should be 7 to 12% of the floor space. Anything uh, more of that is not uh, any more gain? Do you you do space? actually gain more. In fact, um, you have, but you have to start being really careful. In a climate like this, if I were designing a passive solar, I'd probably be about 12 to 14 percent. You have to be very careful. We use computer programs once we do a, once we do a design. We use the computer programs. There's some energy programs. Um, it, um, Energy 10 and another one called Builder Guide for Windows that we we put the data in those and see how they're going to perform at a specific location and then we start messing around with it. But in an area like this, 12% is probably not is probably what you're going to need. Maybe even 14. 12% of the south face. 12% your the south facing glass should be 12% of the square footage of the house. So it'd be, it'd be equivalent to 12 percent. So if you've got 1,000 square feet, you need 120 square feet of, of south-facing glass. 
Now, where a lot of people go wrong is they, they uh, put too much glass in the north. I have a client who had a beautiful solar house that we designed. Her view was to the north, and she's got this massive two-story glass wall. Um, well, I got her at least to triple paint it and to put some insulated shades over it, but you don't want any more than 4%, 4% for your north-facing glass because that's going to lose heat. So all the heat you're gaining is just going to be leaking out the north side of your home. Um, east glass, again, no more than about 4%. Uh, West glass is even less, about 2%. So those are the rules of thumb. And no house, I don't think in all the, the years that I've been des designing and working with solar design, I don't think we've ever had a house that actually worked out this way because there's always some compromise. The river's on the east and they want, they, they just spent $400,000 for this piece of property. They, damn it, they want to see the river, you know, <laughs> or the mountain. So there's just always compromise. I was in an area just recently and the views happened, to, it was Mount Sopris, I was teaching at Solar Energy International, and the views just happened to be south. So they have all these solar houses, and they, they get the glass on the south and the view. So that's the trick. Here's what a, kind of a funky looking solar house down in Taos, New Mexico. Um, they, see a lot of glass on the south, very little on the north side, okay? Very little on the north side. The warmer your climate, the more glass you can have on the north. Um, avoid the tendency to overglaze. It's sort of like penicillin. You know, a lot of people think antibiotics a little good, a lot, got to be a lot better for you. Um, Glazing is the same way, and, and this is one of the most common mistakes. Here's a solar house that was built. It's rammed earth, built in uh, Buena Vista, Colorado. This lady loves light, so she's got all the south-facing glass, which would probably be more than enough, but then she put <coughs> skylights on too. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight skylights on that structure, okay? Avoid the tendency to overglaze. You see it all the time, you know. And just watch it real carefully, because remember that that glass, um, very low insulation value. So you've got a big glass wall like this at night. It is cold. It is going to be cold. I could tell you some horror stories about solar houses built like this. They become so cold at night, because you maybe only have four, six, seven hours of sunlight. The rest of the time, energy is trying to leave, you know, escape through the glass. And a big glass wall like this actually feels like it's radiating cold on you. It's miserable. So watch that tendency. Um, uh, here's got to be the, the all-time all -time solar design disaster of the world. Look at the south-facing glass on that structure. Man, do you think that that is hot? It's what I call how to create a half a million dollar solar oven. I can sell you a solar oven for a couple hundred bucks, guys. <laughs> Don't do it with a half a million dollars. Avoids traditional skylights. A lot of people think skylights are going to help with solar design. And unless the roof is really steep, they're not. Unless the roof is really steep, a traditional skylight isn't going to get much sunlight during the winter. Okay, so you've got, you got a roof here, you know, 412 pitch. You've got a skylight on here. It's not, the low angle winter sun's not going to come in that unless it's a really steep roof. What happens with skylights over and over and over again is that they overheat in the summer. You just, it's just a great solar, it's a solar collector during the summer. So really, I tell people, avoid traditional skylights. Um, you'll just get into so much trouble with them. Um, look at this guy, he's just got roof glass in general. Any, any roof glass is going to create problems in the summer. This guy, this house just overheats like crazy. Um, now my house, I happen to have a lot of skylights. We're in a very cold climate, 8,000 feet above sea level. Huge amount of thermal mass in the house. We got 20 tons of thermal mass. We're built into the hillside. We're well insulated, and we don't overheat in the summer. In fact, we actually need a little heat. When I left the, just the other day, the temperature dropped 30 degrees. So, um, if I were to do this again, I would put solar tube skylights in here. And the reason I put skylights is because this is a growing area. We grow year-round in there, so I wanted a lot of light during the summer. I didn't want to just grow during the winter. I wanted year-round growing. So we put a lot of skylights in here. Um, <clears throat> it works really well in this particular application. Now, I can get away with it. If I were to do it again, I'd put the solar tube skylights. You get the light without the heat loss. Yeah. They light the, the room pretty well. So yeah, they I've do. I've seen one in action, but I'm they do seeing a, them out in stores now. Yeah, they the do a fabulous store. job. Yeah. Fabulous job. Um, depending on which model you get. Now, my, yeah, you can't really see this very well, but we wanted to block these skylights at night, so my son, when he was eight years old, he and I designed these insulating sliding panels. So we've got insulated, insulating foam with a fabric covering that we just slide over the skylights at night. You're all welcome to use that design. We used a little wooden 
um, built a little wooden track on either side. We just slide them, use a broom handle, and slide them at night to shut off those windows. Um, I meant to patent it. I was going to do a whole line of these things, but I just got too busy. Um, another thing to avoid is angled glass, sloped glass, okay? Vertical glass on your south side. Stay away from angled glass, okay? A lot of, some people like it. It's starting to fall out of disfavor. Um, and the, the theory behind angled glass is that you want your glass, the, the reason people went with it is if, if you know what the, the angle of the sun is on December 21st, the shortest day, what you can do is angle your glass so that the sunlight will hit it perpendicular, 90 degree angle, and that gives you the maximum transmission of sunlight, okay? If it's off a little bit, you'll get more light reflecting off that glass. So the theory behind it was you'll get better solar gain if on December 21st that glass is angled. Well, they're right, but it, the, the gain is so insignificant, it's not worth it. The problems are so major. Uh, that glass is in sunlight 12 months a year. That heat uh, then will cause the joints, to, the seals, to expand and contract. And over time, these windows will leak. You'll get leakage during rainstorms. You'll get moisture that flows in between the window panes. Stay away from angled glass. It is just not worth it. It may be pretty, and I've never been in one of these houses that wasn't hotter than hell in the summer because this, the glass is still in the sunlight. There's no overhang. You can't provide overhang. Now, there's a builder in Colorado who says I'm absolutely nuts, but what he does is he puts shade cloth over the glass. He builds them like this, and he puts shade cloth over, over his... Uh, windows during the summer and who I mean it's like living in a dungeon who wants to do that so bad bad design stay away from it um, overhang provide adequate overhang there's a lot of tricks to overhang overhang overhangs your on off switch for your solar system it's your passive solar systems on off switch it determines when the season heating season begins and ends so as the sun they say let's, let's imagine I've got a house right here this is the south facing glass and the sun is low in the sky and it's heating that house and as it gets to a certain height the, the overhang will stop the sunlight from getting in the house so it turns the heat it turns your heat off so the sun stays high all summer and then it starts coming down and when it gets below the overhang your heating system turns off so it's your on off switch and <clears throat> there's a lot to say about overhang um, I got 20 minutes to go I'm on principle 5 be real careful with them. There's some creative ways. This house, was, this was the one I bought. Um, the designer did a really good job. He cantilevered the second floor, so he actually has the second floor jutting over the first floor by a couple feet to provide some overhang. What you see, a lot of mistakes are two-story glass walls, and there's no shading on the lower level of glass. Bad idea, bad idea. This guy was smart. There's all glass down here. Can't tell because of the lights in here, but, but um, that cantilever protects that glass from, from heating heating up. Um, so you get some real good shading. This is in June. You'll notice these south facing walls, are, they're covered. They're really well shaded. Um, this house has a whole story in and of itself. That, uh, here's, this is what you see a lot of. Two story, three story glass walls. It's absolute nightmare. People love them. They're beautiful. They love them and I just get it all the time. Oh man, I, just probably every other client wants a two story glass wall. But unless you shade this glass, somehow, you're just creating a furnace. You're creating a furnace to live in. Bad design, bad design. All right, and I, I mean, I get calls from engineers. There's a house in California, they call me, what can we do? Because my clients are absolutely frying in this house. No overhang, so you had to go back and retrofit with overhang. So be really careful. Overhang's really crucial. You can get creative, and this, this is a little solar house built out of uh, straw clay in New Mexico and the solar glazing, the south facing glass is on this end and they built a little uh, hip roof off here so that it provides shade. Normally with a gable roof like this, this would be unshaded because that, that overhang is too high, too high away from it. So they built this little hip roof off here to provide the shade. Smart idea, very smart design. Okay, thermal mass. This is a design of mine. This is a little attached sun space I built. Worked marvelously. I, I, I just couldn't have done, well, I did one thing wrong. But it worked really, really well. Good thermal mass in the floor, um, thermal mass in the walls. We were able to grow in here um, all year round. I checked temperatures the first year I lived in this structure, in this house, 
and it dropped below freezing only twice during the winter and it was like 20 30 below zero it dropped below freezing in here only one twice and once i left the door open so um you know thermal mass is really important for absorbing heat um <clears throat> It's really tricky and it's expensive. Mass is expensive. To put mass into a house, thermal mass, some kind of concrete and tile or brick or uh, rammed earth or adobe, something to absorb that heat. Sand? So then, see? Sand? Well, yeah, under a floor or something. But um, if you don't put thermal mass, you'll get these kind of temperature swings like this. It'll get really, really hot during the day and really, really cold during at night. So it'll do this massive swing. Put mass in a house, thermal mass inside the house, and you get a, a much more comfortable temperature swing. So it's really important, and it's hard in hell to get it right. It's really <laughs> difficult. There's a lot of advice in this book on, solar, on thermal mass. Um, these guys built adobe interior walls, and they've got a tile floor. Provides a lot of thermal mass. Um, Here's a house, this is a solar house. It's uh, owned by a guy who's a big solar advocate. Um, he didn't build it, he bought it, no thermal mass whatsoever. And this is what you see. In a lot of houses without thermal mass, they have to just shut the windows. They have to sh pull the shades down because it's too dang hot. So with thermal mass, you can get that heat into the structure and you can have it all night long. Okay, that thermal mass will hold the heat and release it into the room at night. So, <clears throat> I'm going to skip some of these. Okay, because mass is expensive, I like it to perform several functions. Okay, so that client's going to say, well, Dan, mass is so expensive. I don't just want to put a mass wall. And I say, well, let's not. We'll use it for floor coverings. We can do earth floors. We can do a, um, a, a sand and, and um, um, brick floors, uh, flagstone. So, so it's it's doing several functions. It's ser serving as thermal mass and it's creating a nice attractive floor. Um, we like to build a lot of planters in houses uh, that will absorb, um, that will provide mass and provide beauty as well. Um, a fireplace or a masonry heater can double as thermal mass. Um, <clears throat> partition walls, you can build some of your partition walls out of uh, mass materials like, like adobe. Um, so it, it acts as heat storage um, and it provides beauty. Here's a couple examples. There's a, a, a masonry heater, super high efficient uh, wood burning stove that also serves as thermal mass. So the sun shines on it during the day, heats it up, and, and the, the structure reserves all that heat and releases into the room at night. Here's a lady down in New Mexico that she built these room partitions um, with little planters. So it provides some beauty. She's got some beautiful um, uh, plants. I forget what those are. Kind of look like carnations, don't they? Um, but they, she got plants in there, so it adds some beauty, adds some humidity, and it provides some privacy, and it functions as thermal mass. So, so if you're going to put mass in, which you should, be sure to you know you've got to uh, make it work for you. How much mass? That's too much to talk about. What about um, columns of water? Um, columns of water work well. Um, they, they they have many uh, they have many benefits over over masonry type mass in that they hold more heat. They actually have a higher heat capacity, but they release it faster. I've always thought we should do a column of water and rocks to combine the, the two benefits, the features of both. Is it, it would get hotter in rocks or ma masonry material gives off the heat more slowly. Um, they're a little hard to locate in a house, to, to situate in there with aesthetics. So we don't really see a lot of it, frankly. Um, I like it though, it's a good idea. Insulate, insulate, insulate. Absolutely important that you insulate well. Your walls, ceilings, don't forget foundations. Don't forget foundations. Uh, and even windows. A lot of solar people like light. And you know, who doesn't? But they make the mistake of building these big, mat big glass walls, but they never cover them at night because they want the light. They want to see out the windows. And at night, as I told you earlier, you just lose a lot of heat through those windows. So you've got to cover your windows at least with a cellular shade. Better something like a warm window, which is kind of a quilt material with mylar in it, or even better rigid foam um, thermo shutters. I talk about that in the book. It's really a great strategy. I use them in my house kind of experimentally, and you wouldn't believe what a rigid foam shutter in a window will do at night. I mean, you, inside. And so you can put them outside, but it, they're easier to, to handle inside. Um, so don't forget those windows and don't forget the um, don't forget the foundation. All right, got 11 minutes left. Um, choose an environmentally friendly form of insulation. Remember, we're bottling up these houses. We're making them airtight and energy efficient. 
You don't want to put in insulation that's going to outgas toxic chemicals. You don't want to use any building material that's going to outgas toxic chemicals. So choose a form that's friendly. My favorite in the world is, uh, um, I build with natural materials a lot, like straw bale, but, but as far as roof or ceiling insulation, I like blown cellulose. I just love cellulose. It's a recycled uh, product. It's made out of recycled newspaper, sometimes a little cardboard thrown in there. It's got some borate, uh, sodium borate is a flame retardant and a uh, insect repellent. It's a great product at a high R value per inch. It's easy to install. Um, the wet blown tends not to, to uh, sink, it maintains its loft. So it's, it's a great product. There are other, that's, so there's my favorite, but um, isonine is a new product, fairly new product. I don't have a lot of experience with it. It's a foam that you blow into walls. Um, it doubles as a, a vapor barrier and it'll stop moisture from flowing in. You can't do it yourself, but it's gotta be implied by a licensed um, isonine applicator. Cotton, uh, good insulation material. Um, you can, they're making insulation. In fact, the last slide was cotton insulation. Um, wool is great insulation material. It's one of the very few that doesn't lose our value when it gets wet. You know, if you're wearing a, a wool sweater and it's getting wet, you, it still maintains its uh, R value. It's still able to hold heat in. So wool is a, is a great insulation. You don't see a lot of it. Um, and then, of course, there's fiberglass as a possibility. Here's the deal with insulation is that most local building codes are inadequate. So many, some, very few um, municipalities have even adopted the model energy code, okay? Very few of them have even adopted that, and that even sucks, frankly. Most of the solar designers will exceed the International Energy Code or Energy Star recommendations. That's what we use. We go 30% over these recommendations, and you're going to get a lot of raised eyebrows when you tell people you're going for R40 walls and R50 or 60 ceiling. They go, well, we know that when you, as you add insulation, you get to a point where you're not getting anything more out of it. Well, you know, that's not always true. Um, what we recommend is in temperate climates, R30 walls and R60 ceilings, which is way over code, and in a hotter, cold climate, R40 and R80. And what, um, let's see, why don't we talk, I got like eight minutes, so, um, so anyway, read the book or talk to me privately. I'm going back to sign books and be happy to talk to you about insulation, but uh, it doesn't hurt. I put an extra thousand dollars into insulating my house, and I mean, it just performs so well. It's just unbelievable. Um, one thing to look at is this frost protected shallow foundation. This is a, a, a straw bill wall, and this is the foundation wall. We put um, vertical insulation along here, a layer of crushed rock, and then horizontal insulation here. A fabulous strategy. It raises the frost line. It traps heat that was trying to escape from the house and also heat that's coming up from the earth, and it effectively raises the frost line. So if you're building in, what's your frost line here? Five feet? Five, Five feet. So you're building in a, cli a climate like this, Instead of having to build a foundation that goes below frost line or five feet, you can actually build a two foot foundation, frost protected, insulation on the vertical wall and wing insulation. You can build a, you can build a foundation that's only two feet deep and because you're effectively raising the frost line around the house. It reduces the flow of heat out of the house, saves you a lot of money in excavation and in, and in foundation work and, and concrete. So, um, a great thing to look into, this frost-protected shallow foundation. Protect your insulation from moisture. Um, use vapor barriers. Um, proper foundation and grading, you got to make sure that moisture doesn't wick up through your foundation. Um, drain the house, make sure the drainage is adequate. You don't want water sitting up against the foundation that can seep up into the walls. Um, overhang is important. A lot of people are building houses more cheaply to, and they say, well, you don't put so much overhang on or don't put any overhang on. Well, you lose a very valuable function in protecting those walls from moisture. So uh, it's not worth it. Window details, a lot of mistakes in uh, houses around window details. Moisture gets in, um, ruins the insulation. Um, airtight design, uh, vapor barriers. Oh, I got that twice. Isn't that interesting? Uh, here's a vapor barrier in a, in a cold climate like this. You place the vapor barrier on the warm side of the wall, which is the interior. But frankly, very, full, very little moisture actually penetrates directly through walls. There's a lot of mythology about uh, vapor barriers. Most of the water that's going to get into an insulated cavity, that's what this squiggly line is, that's insulation. Most of the water that's going to get in there isn't going to get in through the, the drywall. Most of it's going to enter through penetrations. If you've got recessed cans, um, lights, if you've got um, 
uh, light switches, wall switches, any cracks. Um, that's how moisture gets into walls. So a lot of people will put vapor barriers up, but they don't do anything to seal up the, the outlets, electrical outlets. So a little bit of caulk or some fo some foam gaskets will help um, seal those seal those off and prevent moisture from getting in there. So not only does moisture lower the R value, it can also cause mold to build up inside the wall. That can create health problems. Those spores get into the air. Uh, moisture builds up enough, it can actually cause structural deterioration. My neighbor just finished paying his 30-year mortgage off and found out for 30 years his house has been leaking moisture and he had to spend $125,000 to mitigate the problem. Just got done paying his mortgage and he's got another $125,000 because moisture was leaking into the walls, destroyed the insulation, the frame, it rotted out the framing members. What a nightmare. So watch that stuff. Make a house airtight. There's a lot of places in houses that leak air. Seal it up tight. Do a really good job of sealing. Um, seal it tight, but usually we ventilate it in addition. So if you seal a house up, it's, it, it's important, it's imperative that you put a ventilator in of some sort, a heat recovery ventilator. It's just a device that exhausts stale room air and brings in fresh air, but instead of just, instead of just pushing air, hot air out and cold air in in the winter, it, the, the two air streams cross so there's a transfer of heat. So the outgoing air transfers its heat to the ingoing air, so you get about 70 or 80 percent of the heat back. Um, it's much more efficient than just building a leaky house. A lot of people say, why don't you just build it leaky and not worry about this? It's much better to control your ventilation than let it control you. Because who the hell wants ventilation when it's 40 below and the wind's blowing at 60 miles an hour? That's a time where you just don't want a house to have a lot of ventilation. So use healthy building materials. I talked about this earlier. Um, you're sealing up a house, low or no VOC paints and stains. VOC is volatile organic chemicals like formaldehyde. Um, potentially toxic, potentially carcinogenic. What about OSB? <clears throat> OSB, you can find OSB that has no uh, low and no VOC, but as a rule it's not a good product to build with. Um, it's okay on the roof and exterior because that doesn't get into the house so much, but for subflooring I would avoid it. Um, or I would get the products, the no or low VOC products. Um, healthy carpeting, Formaldehyde's in just about everything. You buy pressed uh, particle board furniture, cabinets, it's got formaldehyde in it. Um, carpeting, window coverings, formaldehyde's just in about everything, so you gotta be really careful. Formaldehyde's that stuff we pick with cadavers with. You know, it's the stuff we preserve cadavers. At levels that you can't even smell it, it is known to cause multiple chemical sensitivity. It's a, it's a very debilitating immune system disorder. Um, you wanna avoid causing that. It might not happen to you, probably we won't, but it's, I just, to me it's just not worth the worst. Or that's not worth the, uh, the risk. Consider earth sheltering. If we're talking about building an airtight home, I love earth sheltering. This is just a wonderful way to protect your home from the cold winter winds, to keep the house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. My house is earth sheltered and I can go away for two weeks over Christmas time to visit our kids' grandparents. I'm going to be 20 below zero every night when I'm gone. And we just leave the shades open on the south-facing windows. This isn't my house, but we leave the shades open so it gets some solar gain during the day. That house never gets below 52 degrees. And I never have to turn on any backup heating. It never gets below 52 degrees because of the earth sheltering, okay? So you snug that house into a warm earth and you've got a, you've got a great structure to live in. So consider earth sheltering. I, it's a wonderful area. It also, for those of us who don't like maintenance, all that stuff's underground. You don't have to paint. You don't have to fix the windows. That, I mean, to me, that's my ideal house. Uh, you got to be. You got to design it right. You got to. You don't want to. You don't want to design a leaky house. All right. So I'm closing down here. I got one minute left. <clears throat> design your home so that each room is heated directly by the sun. We like open designs. Now you can end up with the solar trailer phenomenon, where you have this long, skinny house, and every room is its own collector. Um, a lot of people don't like that. So um, basically, open designs work pretty well with solar. It's better to have a house that's rectangular, okay, that's shallower rather than square, because that gets more solar heat, more solar energy into the back of the house. So um, open floor plans, um, rectangular floor plans all work very, very well. And if you're going to build more of a boxy structure, concentrate rooms that don't require as much heat along the back. Kitchens, for example. You don't really need a lot of heat in the kitchen. Okay? Um, bedrooms, uh, utility rooms, those are the kinds of rooms you put on the north side of the house. The, the main living areas are on the south side. 
Avoid sun drenching. Now, sometimes I get laughed at when I talk about this. I was giving a speech in uh, northern Idaho, and I said, you know, when this is the typical phenomenon that the people solar gain, the, you know, the, the solar living space begins right where the windows end, and it really results in a lot of sun drenching. You bake your cats and dogs, and um, they laughed at me in Idaho and said, you know, damn, when the sun's out, we want to be in it. But so if you're in one of those climates, then you don't have to worry so much about this phenomenon. Um, I like to create a buffer zone. Again, though, make it use multiple, per make it serve multiple purposes. This is my uh, buffer zone. It's a growing area. We use, we recycle gray water in here. It provides beauty and humidity. It's, it's a solar gain area. It's where the sun comes in. It's bright and cheery. It's very pretty, but it's also a walkway. So it serves a whole bunch of purposes. And a lot of solar designers early on would build these um, areas like this. It's a huge area to bring the sun in, but you can't live in it. And so it's a, square footage is expensive, is all you know. Square footage is very expensive. So you want to avoid um, putting in square footage to invite the sun in if you're not getting other uses out of it. So make it serve multiple functions. All right. So there's a picture of the interior of my house. You can't really see it well, but I'll take these to my booth. And if you want to look at them, you can look at them there. Provide backup heat. OK, I'm out of time. Code's going to most likely require you to provide backup heat. But the number one mistake I see, people build these super energy efficient solar homes. They're going to get 80, 90 percent of their heat from the sun. They're just airtight, energy efficient. And they come to me and say, Dan, I want to put in a radiant floor heating system because I like warm feet at night. And I tell them it's pure economic stupidity. And I usually polite, say it more, a little more politely than that. But for you, I'll tell you that. It's economic stupidity. Why put a $15,000 system in to provide a couple hundred dollars worth of heat every year? Makes no sense. I tell my clients I can put some space heaters in to heat the space to provide you backup heat. We can automate them. You know, they'll work fine. It'll cost you two or $3,000 as opposed to $15,000. You give me the rest of the money, I'll send you a new pair of socks every week for the rest of my life. <laughs> So be real careful. You build these super energy efficient homes. Don't go overboard on heating systems. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> enough said. Let's go. All right. So we all know um, we all know the benefits of passive solar heating and cooling. And I'm actually going to leave it at that because you're going to jump on me pretty soon here, aren't you? Yeah. All right. So. <laughs>